the enemy of your soul has been in direct opposition to you. But today is your day of healing. Healing commences in your life in the name of Jesus right now. If you would only believe, but God, I'm too far away from you. But God, I'm not even sure if I believe in you anymore. But God, they hurt me too much. Today is your day of healing. God is more powerful and more able than anything that you've experienced. Approach him boldly. Approach him with the teensy tiny amount of faith that has you still listening to me. And ask him to bolster your faith. And you'll see what he can do. The truth of the matter is that you have to ask yourself when it comes to your purpose and when it comes to intimacy with God, can you achieve what you truly want by continuing on the path that you are currently on? What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Valley of the Heroic podcast, where we talk all things from down in the valley up into the mountaintop where we roar for God's glory. But remember, you get your voice in the valley. Or maybe you never heard me say that before. But either way, we talk all things that relate to growing in the times of pain and darkness up into the places of purpose where God uses us and we experience intimacy with him in a special and beautiful way. I want to welcome you to today's episode where we're going to discuss how to go back to church. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you are currently in or have been in a situation where you went through some church hurt or you went through some personal stuff or for some reason you uh, fell away or were uh, 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 going through a time where you stopped going to church and you're thinking about going back now and you're wondering to yourself, how do I get there? Now, we're going to approach this specifically more so from a pace, place of uh, you went through some type of pain. There was some type of darkness to happen. But stay in here until the end because I feel like you're going to be able to get something. And at the end, I'm going to give you guys some practical tips and next steps that you can take to be able to start your process for getting back to church again. So it's all about taking the journey after taking the journey back to church after you after you've experienced some time away so i want to share with you a little bit of my story there was uh in my life i've only been a member <clears throat> of two different churches and uh, for me specifically i went through a battle against depression in 2016 now in my specific story the first year of my marriage also coincided with my first bout against a uh, severe depression. The doctor gave me this diagnosis of um, severe single episode, something like that, right? So I was having a very serious bout with depression and throughout this whole process, it led to my wife and I uh, leaving our church and uh, spending some time away from church. Now we still considered ourselves Christians. I definitely went through a dark time and um, I wouldn't say that I went as far as leaving my faith, but uh, I needed time away from the church because for me, church actually started to feel uh, oppressive. <laughs> and I know that that wasn't God's intent. Obviously, the church is a place for us to heal, for us to grow. And that's probably why you're listening to this episode today, because you're coming to that realization. And while I knew that still, I knew that in that specific season of my life, because a lot of my pain was attached to ministry, was attached to church, was attached to my own failures in my own faith, uh, every time I would go to church, I would literally just feel oppressed. I would feel uh, 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 so much more broken. And so we took a season away. Now, whether that's right or wrong, we're not really going to get into. But uh, after some time away, we decided that we were going to go back to church. And so I was able to take that process from, from leaving and coming back to a point where I said, you know what, I feel like I'm okay enough to be able to 
commit to attending again. And that was the key, just attending. I wasn't really looking to uh, uh, find a, a new place for me to serve even or to get a platform or anything like that. It was really just about attending, being committed, uh, being a part of a body and reestablishing roots again, right? A plant that is not planted will seldom grow, okay? Uh, it needs roots. It needs to be able to spread its roots in order to be able to grow its full fruit. And so it's the same with us. So I want to take you through a two, uh, two step, if you will, process that hopefully will help give you the guideline that you need to be able to get towards getting back to church and doing so in a healthy way that not only honors God, but honors you in a sense, right? For lack of a better way of saying it, in order for us to be able to do things in a healthy way, we have to do so in a way that honors where we are and who we are and the people that we're connected to and what we believe in. And in order to do that, you have to have clarity of mind. You have to be able to, to uh, get rid of some of the things that got in the way in the first place, limiting you and stopping you from being able to commit and to congregate and to, to connect with what God is trying to do in your life. And so the first, that leads us perfectly into what I believe is the first step, and that is to agitate, don't complicate, right? So the question I have for you is what's in your cup? What is in your cup? Before you're able to step back into a church, I want you to go through a process of trying to do some internal walk work not walk, <laughs> some internal work. And if you can invite God into this process, obviously, obviously, I'm going to encourage you to invite God into this process and invite him into the, into the actual steps of you saying, God, I want to look internally and see what may have caused me to fall away from you. God, I want you, the scriptures tell us that various people, right? Uh, David, if I'm not mistaken, said for to the Lord, he said, search me, O God, and reveal what is within me. Search me, O Lord. And in asking God to search us, what we're really doing is we're inviting the Holy Spirit. We're inviting God to show us what's really inside of there. And so agitate, don't complicate. What I mean by that is we want to agitate what's inside of that cup, but we don't want to complicate the process. We want to achieve clarity, not complication. I want you to be able to see what is before you. If it were a table, instead of a cup, if it were a table, can we separate all of the different things on the table and place them in a way so that you can see as much as you can that's on there and say, okay, this is what's on the table. Now I know what I need to deal with, what needs to remain, and what needs to leave. What needs to be dealt with, or in other words, what needs to be changed, what needs to be removed, and what needs to remain on this table. In our cup, it's the same thing. And so why do I use the word agitate? Uh, agitating basically is the process of us um, taking something and mixing it or stirring it. You're agitating it by creating movement within it so that it starts to mix or it starts to... Um, uh, 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 move in a certain way, for lack of a better way of saying it. So like if you're watching on video, you can see this cup in my hands. There's this water in this cup. And if you get a closer look, you'd be able to see that it's not clean water, right? And agitating this cup might mean me like stirring it, going like this and stirring what's inside of it or taking my finger 
and you being able to see the things that's in there, mixing around, seeing the things more effectively, right? Hopefully that's showing through on the video. And if you're able to see, you'll see that the water, the stuff that's on the bottom, some of the, the dirt that's on the bottom, if I mix it even better, some of that dirt starts to rise up. And if I would have left this actually for about a week or two, all of that dirt would have gone down to the bottom. I didn't have a, I should have done this a week or two ago, but all of that dirt probably would have gone down to the bottom. But if you look over here, let me put it in front of my face so that it's not trying to catch my eye. If you look over here, you'll see, you'll see items floating inside of it. Maybe you see a leaf, maybe you see different strands of like leafy stuff or whatever the case may be. And that's the process of agitation. Water that stands still can get to a place where it looks clean until you agitate it. Now, I just did this right before the call. So you could see, I mean, call, what am I talking about? I ain't on a call with nobody. <clears throat> I wish I was on a call with you guys. That's the only sad part about the podcast. I can't see your faces. So make sure you comment down below if you're watching and you're enjoying this. So because I did this right before the podcast recording, it's still murky. The water's still brown. You could see that. And then as, as I agitated it, yeah, you could see the bits and pieces floating around. You could see the leaf or whatever the case may be, hopefully. But if I would have left it for two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, as more and more time passes, the things that are dirtying the water, making it impure, go from right above the surface and mixed in down to the bottom, down way, way, way below the surface. And it's the same with us. As more time passes, the, the, the idea that time heals can be true in some ways, but in many ways, all time provides is space and opportunity for pains to subside and disappear and, to, riot and to, 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 to drift below the surface where they were so visible and so external before. So does that mean that they're truly healed? Does that mean that they're truly gone? No, it means that it just went down below where it's less prone to being seen. And so when we've gone through church hurt, when we've gone through pain, through ministry or through the church, you probably listening to this today, you've probably gotten to a place where a lot of time has passed and you think, I'm good now. I can go back to church. I'm chilling. It's a great time for me to, to, to begin. I remember when I used to worship the Lord. I remember when I used to serve. I remember how great it felt to be in ministry. I remember how great it felt to be committed. And then two, three weeks in, that pain that is below the surface, deep, deep, deep down inside of you, rises up almost instantly because instead of agitating it to the surface so that you could deal with it, Something triggered it to the surface and it rises up like a volcano. And now that pain that was undealt with that you thought was healed is causing you to live in the past right here in the present. And so before you even commit to church, wow, who, what, what Christian leader or Christian preacher or, or pastor or whatever says that to you they tell you just jump right in no before you jump in i want you to bring your pain to the lord i want you to agitate but don't complicate and don't oversimplify either your frustration your pain will have to rise so that you can focus on what is truly essential for you to commit to in your faith you need to be able to place things on the table and say, you know what? 
the water's supposed to be clear, not murky. So that means I need to find a way to either purify this water or I need to remove it so that I can replace it with clean water. And that leaf that's in there, that's not supposed to be in there. And those little bits and pieces of grass, those those little pieces are not supposed to be in there. If I want a clean a vase of water, that's not supposed to be part of it. Oh, you know what? As I look at this table, everything that's before me, this, this bitterness, this bitterness that I have because I felt like I was always overlooked. Is this supposed to be here? Why is this here? With time and with, with, with hindsight, you're able to say, did I have a legitimate reason? Or was I overlooked because I was a 20-year-old kid and I was immature and I still needed to grow? I was still rough around the edges. Is there an element or a reason by which some of this happened? Was there a, leg a, a legitimate reason to it that balances out maybe the abusive way that my leader said it to me? Did they lack training and resources to be able to communicate effectively? Were they brought up in a healthy system to be able to communicate in a way that both reaches people and pastors and shepherds them along? Or were they just leading from their own pain? Let me look at my table. Let me look at my cup. When I agitate it, what rises to the surface? And as the most beautiful thing is that as you agitate it and you begin to prayerfully look at all the bits and bobs and odds and ends and you see pain on the table, you also see the beautiful hand of God that held you, that held you throughout the whole process you went through that still lovingly saw you, that sees you even now today, that says to you, it is time for you to submit your fear to me. It is time for you to let go of these stories that you've been telling yourself since your youth, because sometimes people are going to choose another person. And that does not mean that you're inadequate. Sometimes someone might overlook your ability and that has no bearing on who I've called you to be. It just means that they didn't see it. But I see you. You're able to see God's handiwork in protecting you and bringing you to where you are even today to tell you it is time for you to go back home. Maybe not to the same home, but it's time for you to go back home. Come home, my child. I miss you being in my house. Amen. So, as those frustrations arise and as we, we take a look at everything that's there, we're able to make our commitment practical. You're able to say, okay, these are the things I need to commit to. I need to commit to attending weekly and I need to commit to not serving immediately so that I can continue my healing process. And I need to, I'm giving you guys keys here. I need to commit to making sure that I go with my family together if they're willing to go. I need to commit to going by myself if my family is not committed to going. I need to commit to a church that displays healthy principles and not unhealthy ones or not cult-like ones. Maybe I need to commit to trying a church that is completely radically different so that I'm not triggered. I need to commit to reading my words so that I can see and discern things that are not according to your will. I need to commit to humility because I'm too quick to pull the trigger of thinking that I know what your will is. Ask God to give you direction and guidance so that he can help you control 
what is truly controllable in your life. So, as you do that, I also want to make note of the fact that you're going to be coming to terms with the reasons, the reasons that you were initially frustrated. You're going to be coming to terms with the reasons that you actually left church in the first place. And as you do that, as you do that, you have to come to terms with two things. Number one, the water wasn't as clean as you thought it was. Like we said earlier, the dirt just fell to the base. And therefore, so that means that you need to come to terms with the reality that you have not healed yet. But on the flip side of that, you need to come to terms with the fact that now you are in the prime position to begin your healing process. Again, agitate, don't complicate. God is in the mix. Uh, I love how, I don't know, this might be a little too niche for some of you guys, but uh, in the books, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, I love, it's an, it's all of it is an allegory of the Christian faith. And Aslan is a picture of Jesus. He's a, 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 a little, sorry, he's a, um, an example or a, 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 an illustration of Jesus, right? He's based off of him. And there's parts in the book, I'm not sure if it's one part or there's parts of the book, but I know for sure there's one where it says Aslan is on the move. The lion of the tribe of Judah is on the move. Goosebumps. Because it meant that they, the time of their suffering, the time of their brokenness, the time that they experienced apart from God was now over because Jesus is on the move. And I believe that that's a word for somebody who's listening. Jesus is on the move in your life. Matter of fact, that's a word for all of you. Jesus is on the move, whether you see it or not. And so while you may have been through a process where you felt like you could not heal and you were just broken, now is the time for healing. Jesus is on the move. And number two, the second thing that that be, that um, is made clear when we come to terms with those reasons is that you might want to get this dirt out of the cup so that you are healthy. You might want to do something about this so that you can walk in health and so that you can be in a better place. And so the first step in being able to do that is to assess those reasons. Take a look at those reasons and ask yourself, what are those reasons? Maybe you need to write them out. Maybe you need to just say them audibly. I would suggest you do something though, right? And you need to ask yourself, what are those reasons? If you think it's just one reason, ask yourself, is that true? Is there more than one reason? Do you not believe in the church's ability to actually reach people? Do you not trust pastors? Excuse me. Are you scared of the commitment? Is, too, is it too much work for you right now in your life to commit to church? What are your reasons? And once you're able to come to a place where you understand what your reasons are, ask yourself then, what do you need to focus on? What do you need to focus on? Ask yourself, number one, what is your why? Why do you need to commit to church? Maybe you don't have a reason. I'll give you some. Without church, you ain't going nowhere. Without church, you are going to wander in the valley for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? I'm going to keep it real with you right now. Without church, you are just going to be full of a love with Jesus and full of the feeling of being apart from him. No matter how much you try to convince yourself, when we walk in disobedience to God, we know deep down inside in our spirit, we know that God is displeased with us in some way. And if his word tells us 
to not forsake committing to each other, to not forsake congregating with one another, to not commit, to not forsake the coming together of God's family. Who are you to say that reading your Bible at home is enough? Maybe it's enough for you to convince yourself that you're good. Maybe. Maybe it's enough for you to, to feel like you're Christian, quote unquote, enough, whatever that means. Because I know I'm not Christian enough on my own. I need Jesus, number one, and then I need his people. I need his body. How can I be a part of his body if I forsake his body? How can I be a part of his body if I forsake his body? It don't work. So what's your why? Maybe you need to ask yourself, what's your why for being so resistant to it? Maybe you're watching this and you're like, I don't even know why I'm watching this because I'm not even ready yet. When are you going to be ready? When are you going to be ready? When are circumstances going to be perfect enough for you to say that you could go back? Granted, if you need to heal, heal. I went through my process. But when time came up and we knew, my wife and I both knew, we said, all right, it's time to go back. This feeling of oppression is not there no more. I did what I needed to do to heal. It took time. In the beginning, it was messy. I did not do well in the beginning. But maybe some of you just need a little jolt. And maybe some of you need a little bit of love. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. You deserve to be a part of a community of love. You deserve to find your people. I know the church, it feels like it was robbed from you and you grieve that in ways that you don't even understand every day. So I want to remind you that being a part of God's family is your birthright. Yep. Being a part of God's family is your birthright. And the devil has been stealing it from you all of this time. Knowing that if you commit to a healthy family, knowing that if you commit to health yourself, knowing that if you're able to get to a place where you are in true and beautiful community, you would flourish in ways that scare him and anger him. And so the enemy of your soul has been in direct opposition to you. But today is your day of healing. Healing commences in your life in the name of Jesus right now. If you would only believe, but God, I'm too far away from you. But God, I'm not even sure if I believe in you anymore. But God, they hurt me too much. Today is your day of healing. God is more powerful and more able than anything that you've experienced. Approach him boldly. Approach him with the teensy tiny amount of faith that has you still listening to me. And ask him to bolster your faith. And you'll see what he can do. The truth of the matter. Is that you have to ask yourself. When it comes to your purpose. And when it comes to intimacy with God. Can you achieve what you truly want. By continuing on the path that you are currently on. Can you achieve your purpose and what God has called you to? Can you achieve intimacy with God, true joy in him, true peace in him by continuing the path that you are currently on? I remember talking to one of my brothers recently, and he was very frustrated about a situation. He was so upset about something that happened to him. And he told me, I'm not, he basically told me, I'm not going to do the right thing because I'm tired of it. And I told him, 
that he has the right to do that. He could do whatever he wants. And I told him that if he did, he would be miserable. And he looked at me like, what? What do you mean? I said, let me ask you a question. Do you feel like inside of you, you have a strong desire to be a good man? He said, yes. I said, do you feel like inside of you, you have this thing that pushes you to want to be not just not not great for your own sake, but to be good, to care for people in the future? Do you want to be a good husband? Do you want to be a good father? He said, yeah, I do. I'm asking him these questions because I know the answer to them. And I said to him, every day you will make decisions on whether you will be good or whether you will choose your own way. And when you choose good, you satisfy that side of you, that inner desire inside of you to be good. And when you don't, you go in direct opposition to the way that God created you. And you create misery within your own spirit. We continued our conversation and the words really reached him. But I want to take this and share it with you because I want to remind you that you are wired to connect with God more deeply. Last week, Joanna and I did a uh, podcast episode uh, in the car. Actually, it's really funny titled Messy Church. It's a great supplementary episode to this if you feel like you're just tired of the messiness of church and want to hear a conversation on what to do with that, right? Take a look at that episode. We'll link it at the end. And and it's the same concept. We spoke about how you are wired to connect with God more deeply. And so no matter how messy church may get, and it's going to get messy because people are involved, you need to understand that that wiring is not going away. I shared a story on the episode about a friend I talked to at one point who used to go to church with me who said that no matter what he does, no matter how far he might backslide, no matter how, how much he, he doesn't go to church or whatever, God is still there and that it makes him miserable. And that was crazy to me because once you have tasted and experienced God, it doesn't matter how much you try to fill that hole, you won't be able to. You were wired to connect with God and to connect with people. And the more that you avoid that, the more that misery is cultivated deep down inside of you where you think that you buried it deep enough and it's not affecting you anymore. So I leave you with this question before we transition to the next step. Can you achieve closeness with God, something you deeply desire, by continuing on the same path that you are on right now? Or do you need to make a change? Step two. So agitate, don't complicate. What's inside of your cup? Well, step one. Step two is take back what is yours. And we alluded to this not too long ago. Community is your birthright. So one was an internal searching of finding those pains, finding those reasons, analyzing them, praying through them so that you can be in a position of health. And now it's, a, it's an external commitment we go from internal to external, excuse me. And so we start off with this question, what is the bridge by which you can get back to a place of community again? What is the connector? What is the, the reason, the thing that you can use to get back to a place of community again? Well, you can answer that question by also answering, what do you get out of community? What do you get out of community? Let's read through some of these verses. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25 say this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another 
and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It would be great to commit to a church where people stir each other up in love and good works and encourage one another. It would be great for you to experience that type of love, to be able to go through that type of love in your own personal walk with God. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. Two, I put up one, <laughs> two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So what do we get from this one? When we have, when we are connected to others, we receive a good reward for our toil. I love the concept of how when you grow a team, it's not addition, it's multiplication. We don't just add to the output that we receive. No, we multiply it. Exponential growth because it's it affects us in so much more ways than just simply adding another brain and body to the mixture. No, it's much more than that. There's a good reward for the toil of you working with other people. You will lift each other up. You will keep each other warm. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What a powerful, powerful, powerful point for us to understand that God is with us. I want to take the opportunity to present to you our Patreon page. The reason why I'm sharing it with you in this point is because it's a perfect time for us to talk about the different opportunities that you have to get more connected with the work that we're doing here on Valley of the Heroic. If you are seeking to grow in your faith, if you want to get closer to Jesus, if you want to get more of the different things that we are doing here, then you should definitely check out our Patreon page. On our Patreon page, we have access to exclusive content, exclusive live Q and A's, exclusive behind the scenes content, all of this geared towards helping you to grow in your faith for as little as $5 a month. You can commit to helping us to continue to grow, to reach more people with the content, the creative videos that we're creating for Jesus Christ so that we can make this sustainable and continue to reach others. I pray that you would consider uh, becoming a member. And either way, I'm glad that you are here and that you are a part of our family. Let's get right back to the episode. Continuing on from there, we have James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. James chapter 5, verse 16, one of the things that stands out to me the most there is so that you may be healed. Committing to community gets you to a place that you may be healed again. You need to go back to the body to be healed from anything that happens outside of the body or within the body. The body is the way by which God brings healing to his people. And that's who he uses. These are just some examples of what uh, we gain by being in community. Now, as a Christian, another point here. As a Christian, you have the right to community given to you and paid for by Jesus. And what does the devil want to do with all the gifts that God wants to give us? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's why we're talking here about the importance of us taking back what is ours. You need to not only commit to 
the idea of going back to church and realizing what's the bridge and how and all the things that you gain in being part of your birthright. But also you need to understand that there's an enemy that has been trying to rob this from you. And so you have not only the power to take it back, but you also should have the boldness to take it back because it's yours. If I was walking down the street and I had a fo- my phone in my hand and somebody just walks up to me and snatches it out of my hand. And you know, as long as they're not robbing me at gunpoint, <laughs> right? I'm going to take it back because it's mine. And so I want to fill some of you up with the boldness to understand that something was taken from you that is yours. And so now not only is it yours and not only do you should you take it back but you need to understand that community is your birthright right and so snatch it back from the hands of the enemy that took it away from you we did the internal work on, or you will be doing the internal work from here and once you're able to understand i hope you'll be in a place where you realize wow yeah this hurt yeah this was painful but this is mine I know I can get to a place where it's healthy again. We don't give up on love when you have a bad breakup. You take some time off from relationships, maybe. But deep down inside of you, there's a hope that there's someone out there who can love you and see you for who you are. And with Jesus, it's the same. Don't turn your back on Jesus. Don't turn your back on the church because there were some bad churches out there. No. There is still a hope for genuine community for you. There is still a hope for a community that, that, that will help heal you, that will help to stir you up in love, that will help to encourage you, that will give you a good reward for your toil, that lifts you up, that keeps you warm, that, is, that makes you not easily broken. That is what community is about, and it is yours. So I want to end here today with some practical tips. Once you've done all of this and you're in the right mindset, I want to share with you some of the things that we did that might help you get back to church. The first thing we the first thing that we did was we asked ourselves what are we looking for? We made a list, Joanna and I sat down and he said, "What are we looking for in a church?" We focused less on negative things. We didn't compare it to our old church and God, we still love so many of the people that are there. We love there's nobody that we don't love <laughs> that we loved before. Um, and we pray for the church and we have gone back and, and God is still doing wonderful things. Right. Um, but when we were ready to go back to church, we made a list of all the things that we wanted. We knew that eventually we were going to have a family. So there needs to be we wanted to have a children's ministry. We wanted to feel like a very uh, c- strong community. We wanted pastors that we had access to. We cared about biblical preaching, of course. We cared about there being a soundness of ministry. We cared about certain uh, doctrinal beliefs that align with the denomination that we feel uh, um, we are called to. And we made a list of all of these things. And so I want you to write out all of the things that are of value to you, that you care about. And maybe you rank them. Maybe you say, this is the, these are the non-negotiable things. We had some non-negotiable things like... A good uh, a biblical teaching, not good teaching, although that was like a B tier, but A tier was uh, solid biblical teaching. Because if they're teaching stuff that's not in the Bible, then automatic no, right? Put those things that are non-negotiables to you and then make another separation for things that maybe you have some wiggle room on, right? And then we started to look for churches. We started to ask friends what churches they went to and how their experience was. We started to look online for churches that were in our area. We added churches to the list that we already knew about. And we made a church, uh, a list of 10, I believe, 10 churches. And then what we did was we researched on their websites. So I'm giving you a systematic process here. So if you need to rewind and, and go through it again, please feel free to do so. Write this stuff down. This is exactly how we did it. We took the 10 churches and we went to their website. We read what their beliefs were. If anything that was on their website showed that they were not in alignment with our, uh, uh, our non-negotiables, they came off of the list, right? So this is just 
website, and social media. With that being said, when we were done with that, we were down to a list of six. Six churches that met the criteria of our non-negotiables, right? Maybe through having conversations with people, they told us like, hey, you know, this is going on, whatever, whatever. So we took them off the list because we weren't, we were coming from a place of, of pain. We needed a very solid foundation. So then what we did is we took that list of six churches and for six weeks, we visited each church once. We went to each of those six churches one time, just one time we went to visit. Man, this was a long time ago, so I'm like going back. After those six weeks, we sat down, we took notes when we went, right? And we sat down and we wrote down uh, what our observations were. How did we feel? Maybe we talked to some of the leaders there. We had conversations with them, whatever the case may be. Um, we stayed after service. We just went through that process. And after the six, now we sat down and we talked through it, right? And with that, we were able to narrow it down to three churches. And what we did was we went for a second visit to all three of those churches. Your numbers might be a little bit different, but this is how it went for us, right? So six visits, we went six churches. We went for one visit. We sat down, we talked through it. Uh, through just one visit, we were able to narrow it down to three. Now, we're not choosing petty reasons, right? But there were, you know, maybe clear things that got us down to three. Maybe you feel like you need to go to a second visit. Feel free to do that. Do what is best for you. When we narrowed it down for two to, to three churches, I believe what we did was something along the lines of, I know we at least went one more time to all three, um, but I believe we might have went two times to all three. So two, four, six, six visits total for three churches. At that point, we were able to narrow it down to two. So at this point, what we did was we reached out to the pastors of each of the churches and we asked to have a conversation with the pastor. And um, if the pastor's wife wasn't active in ministry, we wouldn't have asked for this. But for both of them, they were. So we asked to meet with the pastor and their wife, the two like main leaders of the church. And that was a, a strong value for us because Joanna wanted to be able to connect to a church where she could also connect with the pastor's wife, maybe not have access to her all the time. That's again, you have to be realistic about the things that you want, but we wanted that was a value for us, right? And if it was a possibility, we wanted to be able to gauge that. And what we did was we requested a meeting with the pastors. Now, this at this point, you guys might feel like uh, we were too excessive, but this is why we felt really good about the church that we went to, right? Um, and again, feel free to tweak and change any parts of the process that you, you want to, right? Once we requested the meeting with the pastors, if they would have said uh, no, which they didn't, then we probably would have taken them off of our list because, you know, um, it just so happens that both of them we kind of had a very loose relationship with. So it would have been really weird. Now, maybe if you're visiting a church, um, I just don't foresee any church saying no to you meeting. Maybe with the senior pastor, yes, but at least with a, a, a leader that you have access to, right? Maybe if the church is bigger, you might not be able to get a meeting with the pastor. And I feel like that's understandable, but maybe it isn't for you. And so again, a bigger church would not fit your criteria. So we requested a meeting, we got the meeting, and what Joanna and I did is before the meeting, we wrote down all of the questions that we could think of that were important to us. And a lot of them came from the list of different things that were values to us. So we wrote out this list of questions. We sat down with the pastors and had about an hour, an hour and a half conversation asking all of these questions that gave us amazing and wonderful answers and had a great meeting with both of the different uh, uh, churches, church leaders. And at the end, we went home, we sat down, we prayed through it. We prayed through the whole process, but we prayed through it. And um, at that point, it felt very clear to us. Now, this is also in mind. I want you to keep in mind here that God could also speak to you very clearly about what church to go to. This is just the process that we did because we felt like we needed ultimate clarity for this next decision that we were making. 
and we felt like we got there. That process helped us to get to that place where we felt clear. We felt like it was God, God gave us the okay. We felt good about it. And there were actually a lot of things that uh, were, they weren't non-negotiables, but there were things that were on our negotiables pile that were not there. And so we had to pray through that. And But God made it very clear that this was the correct choice. And we were very, we were and are very happy about that decision. And that's what I want for you. So this is what I want to do. If any of you have any questions about the process, about church hurt, about going back to church, make sure that you drop it down in the comments down below and I will answer every single one of you as God gives me ability to. <laughs> guys, I hope that you guys enjoyed today's episode and I hope that it was um, uh, not meaningful. Uh, I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, please make sure that you hit the like, subscribe, um, and notification button so that you can get uh, notifications for whenever we put videos out on Valley of the Heroic. We have a whole bunch of different stuff going on here. We have this, the Valley of the Heroic podcast, where it's either me or me interviewing somebody. I have the podcast with Joanna, uh, Good, Brave, and Heroic. We also have our vlogs and our cinematic preachings and all of these different things that we do to help bolster your faith. So you are welcome here. You are welcome to be a part of this community. We love you guys. We hope you, uh, I hope you have an amazing week. Take it easy. Have a great one. Peace.